Well, welcome everyone to East Meets West at the Vice. Today, the 15th of May, Eric Austin and Al Beatty. Well, we're going to discuss with all of you dyeing materials. And let me add my friend Eric Austin in here. And we'll be side by side to start out. And Eric, uh, you said you had a, a video to, to share with us. And I'll back out while well, you take over the stage. Uh, before before you go, before you go, I think we should let let everybody know what we're that you and I talked this week, and we're only going to do this week and next week. Correct. Would you agree? Um, and the re the reasons we we both have, I think, multiple reasons. We kind of want to call it quits for now. This was never intended to be a long, drawn out series. It's it's. East, East meets West, a couple of tires getting together. Al and I have talked about doing something together for a long time. But Al has his uh, obligations, and I've got, uh, you know, I, I've I've religiously um, tried to remain an amateur tire my entire tying career. And there have been exceptions, some time, you know, some money I made uh the fly tire magazine and, 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 uh, selling some flies here and there. But, um, mostly I've tried to be an amateur because I want to tie what I want to tie when I want to tie it. And it's, if, if you commit to, to, um, you know, tying a fly live every week, it's a performance and there's, practice involved just like you practice for any performance there's a there a bunch of technical stuff you have to do if you want to talk about if you want to put up some historical pictures or whatever and it's it's a commitment and it's a commitment that at least for the summer i don't want to make um i i have other fish to fry so to speak <laughs> so uh in any case, Al, I don't know if you want to speak to uh, <clears throat> your, you, you know, reasons why you might want to hang it up yeah, here next. Yeah, I would like to speak about it just just a bit. I truly enjoy these presentations that we do. Uh, after more than sixty five years at the Vice tying commercially, I can I can assure you that I don't hate tying flies. But it's no different than if you were a clerk at a grocery store, uh, going to work probably isn't the one thing you want to do to uh, have a good time. And it's only been since Zoom came into the picture in the last four years we started reaching out and meeting all of you across the digital airwaves that tying once again has become fun until it becomes a drudgery having to prepare for it. And it's, you know, this. Last week and, and this week, I've got four of them. Some some are private when, when when we're hired to do presentations for organizations or training for other organizations, and some aren't. And uh, as Ed said, I think it was last week, for every hour on camera, it takes two hours of preparation. It's uh, and not always. Sometimes uh, you're going into a program in which there's almost no preparation. If you ask me to tie a humpy, all I got to do is reach over and grab some hair and some hackle, and I'm in business. On the other hand, if you need, need to know about the history of the humpy, then I got to spend time just like all of you looking it up. Because, quite frankly, even though I've tied them for 60 years, I still, you know, I don't know the history of all of them right off the top of my head. So anyway, uh, I would hope that at least, well, on a sporadic basis, uh, do them again come fall or winter. But for the summer, like Eric, I'd kind of like to have some time off. And quite frankly, we're focusing a lot of time on our YouTube channel for gardening, Gretchen's Garden and Greenhouse. And that's just another one of the things that we can do together to enjoy each other's company. And flight time will come back again in the fall. Yeah. And I've got a YouTube channel as well that I've neglected for well over a year. And, um, and that had to do with cancer and so forth, but, but I need to get back to that. Uh, so anyway, we both have our, our reasons, but we both really needed to stop at this point. And, uh, you know, it's, 
we've we've both had a blast. I mean, it's this has really been fun and it's gotten me going. But I have to say, um, the last couple of days, I tied a couple of flies without a camera over my shoulder, and it was great. Yeah, I mean, nice not to have an anvil hanging over your head. You know what? Yeah. So, so anyway, uh, let's get to the dying part now. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna play a video, but first, I just want to tell you, uh, you know, I I started a long time ago uh, doing fancy flies and. And of course, I never had the right color feathers. So I started out with Kool-Aid dyeing. And I had, I mean, I had every flavor of Kool-Aid they they made. I had packets upon packets. And uh even even with all of that, um, first of all, Kool-Aid dyeing, I found really wasn't color fast, number one. Number two, um, at least no matter what I did, it, it wasn't, it just wasn't. Number two, um, because they only had X amount of flavors, you couldn't, you couldn't easily get all the colors that you needed. You, you know, try to get a, a dark claret with, with uh, Kool-Aid. It's not easy. And you're, you're mixing now, the good thing about Kool-Aid is it's what you see is what you get to a degree. Um, but anyway, ultimately I went on to, to rip dyes and my problem there was availability. Um, you know, Michael's had some in some colors and not in others, etc. So finally I bit the bullet and, and, went to the Dharma site and looked into acid level dying. And it had always terrified me. It's, oh, it's got acid. It's, it's scary. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. It's, it was easier than any of the other dying I had done. Number one, uh, was reasonably safe. The only problem with acid level dying is, or acid dying as if you want to call it that, and and that's what I'll call it from here on out. The only real problem with it are the fumes that come off your your pot. Don't breathe those in. Um, very hard on your your lungs and your bronchial tubes. And I'm an asthmatic anyway, so I'm very sensitive to it. I can't be around it. I really can't. Other than that, you know, um, you have to have a your a, a a dedicated dye pot, and that's about it. You don't want to be cooking food in it because these dyes are toxic to some degree, but it's a small degree. I've never had any problems. I've never, to be honest, I've never used gloves, though I, I would certainly recommend the use of gloves. Um, I just dye in my street clothes. I've never ruined a shirt. Very easy to do. And I'm going to show a video right now of on um this is it, it's not going to be useful to too many people but it's it's how to dye an indian crow substitute indian crow has four colors associated in in the in the feather and this is um this is how you would dye this is a more complicated dyeing thing but it's but it but each dye bath is is individual and they're all the same and it's easily done. And this will, this will teach you how to, if you've never died with acid leveling dyes, it'll, it'll teach you how to do it. So here goes, let's see if this plays. Um, Al, I can see you pretty well here. Um, just go like this if you can't hear it or something. Okay. Yeah. This is an old Revere wear saucepan that I use for all my dyeing. Uh, I only do small batches. I don't do large, you know, necks or entire skins or anything. Um, primarily small batches of feathers, etc. It needs to be stainless steel. Other than that, you can use anything. Just make sure that it's dedicated only to dyeing. These dyes are poisonous and don't breathe in the fumes. <sighs> Thank you. 
Here are some ringneck pheasant feathers from the ring on the neck. These are a little larger than I'd like. Uh, you want to try to find the smallest ones you can and try not to get ones that have the black tips. There are some that'll have black tips. That black won't die. And uh, I think in this batch, I actually get a couple of those, but uh, we do what we can. This is a solution of Synthropol, uh, just a drop in uh, some water. It's like a detergent like Dawn liquid, only smaller molecules, and it's used to degrease the feathers. And uh, it's important before you dye them to stick them in the synthropole for a while. You know, an hour is good, maybe even longer. Saturate them well with this stuff and try to get them degreased. Too much grease on the feather and it, it won't it won't take the dye well. This is an acid dye from Jacquard that I use, and this will be our base coat, if you will, on these feathers. This is gold ochre. You can use anything that's a tannish, yellowish, brownish uh, dye. This gold ochre works fairly well. With all these all these dyes, it's more of an art than a science. Uh, you've got to really play around to get them where you want them. And unfortunately, it's not a what you see is what you get proposition. The dyes will look different in the dye bath. Here, here's a dye bath I made up with just two, I'm sorry, one eighth teaspoon of the dye, the yellow ochre dye. And you can see how it looks and this is about half a pan of water. You can see how it looks brownish, reddish. There's aspects of it that look yellow ochre, but there's parts that don't. Um, anyway, just make a solution with uh, cold water. And then do some test feathers. And that's very important. This is some citric acid. This is the acid part of the acid dye that we're going we're to add a little bit of this. Once this bath gets going and our stuff is in there, we're going to add a little citric acid. It's harmless. Uh, this is from the Ball Corporation that's used for canning. Readily available on Amazon. Here I've got my dye bath boiling. And you bring it to a boil and then turn it to low or maybe one or two on your stove, uh, very, very low. So it's just simmering a little bit. I'm adding my, I'm adding four test feathers. I use some feathers here with black tips. Uh, I just want to get an idea of how this is going to pan out. And it's a good thing I did this test because you can see how red this dye bath looks. Uh, like I said, it's not what you see, it's what you get. That's why we test. Right here, I'm going to put in the acid, one eighth, two one eighth teaspoons of the ball citric acid. See how it foamed up there? You got to be careful of that if you have a full pot, if you're dying uh, something larger. I, I rarely do more than about a half a pot of dye, but there, there have been times when it's foamed up and overflowed. So be careful. Right here, I'm stirring things around. And right now, I think I'm getting ready to fish them out. And once, once I get one fished out, I'll immediately plunge it into a, a dish of cold water. And that sort of shocks it and stops everything in its tracks. And I got these fished out. Uh, I do a whole process where I dry them off. I do a full-blown test. And they were just too reddish when all was said and done. So I decided to make a, new, a different dye bath. And what I did is I, I poured out half of what I had. 
and filled filled up with with just cold water. In other words, I diluted the bath 50% with water. Notice how you can see the bottom of the pan here. And this worked out just about perfectly. I, I got what I wanted from this. Here are the resultant feathers. And uh, that's about what I was shooting for. Happy with that. They could be a little more tan, I suppose. I don't know. Uh, I don't really have any real Indian crow on hand, so it's hard for me to know for sure. These will look fine on a fly. I know that much. This is another acid dye from Dharma. and Dar I, I order both the Jacquard and the Dharma dyes from Dharma, the Dharma website. I'll link to it below. This is fluorescent safety orange. I'm sure you could use other oranges. This one works well for me. I'm very happy with it. And uh, I've got a lifetime supply. Dharma, Dharma acid dyes are very inexpensive. And you get these big tubs of them. And I'll never use them all. These are my, my gizmos that... Uh, basically prevent the dye from reaching parts of the feathers that are, where I don't want the dye to reach. And uh, they're made from two-inch fender washers available at your hardware store. We'll only be using one of these devices today, and we're going to dye up about um, 24 feathers or so using this, uh, and that's a good number. If you had... Twice as many, you could use two of these at the same time. Here's those devices, one of those devices disassembled, and this is the one we'll use today. Consists of two two-inch rubber fender washers, two stainless steel fender washers, a bolt that fits through them snugly, and that's very important and a wing nut that fits the bolt. So it's very important to get the right kind of bolt. It can't be loose in there or the die will seep in there and ruin whatever you're trying to do. Here is the base. I'm re getting ready here to put my feathers on this. I've got the feathers soaking in a nearby dish and I will wet the rubber part of this, soak it well too. It's just, it makes everything easier to work with if you soak it. Also it, it performs, I, I think it helps with the seal once you put it all together. You'll see what I mean here in a minute. Here I've laid out all 24 as you can see in a, in a circular pattern, I want to dye just the top half of the yellow section of each of these feathers. So just the yellow tips are going to stick out. Anything inside the fender washer will not receive dye. Here it's all put together with just the tips sticking out or the top half of the yellow section on each one sticking out. It's a better way to put it because we'll dye the tips later. Be sure to crank this wing nut down with vice grips. Here is the contraption sitting down in the dye bath. I brought this uh, to a boil. I used one eighth teaspoon of the dye in about a half of uh, a pan of liquid again. You're going to need a way of getting this out, and I use vice grip pliers for that. You could use any kind of any pair of pliers. And you're going to add the acid just as you did before. It's just as we dyed the first 
uh, group of feathers. It's the same thing exactly. Here is what it looks like when it comes out of the dye bath. The tips now are more orange. They're not yellow anymore. But if you take it apart, you can see that the interior parts of the feathers are still yellow. It's just the tips that have the orange on them now. You can also see that they don't necessarily all stick to one side or the other. So you've, you've got to totally rearrange them. And I soak them before rearranging them and also re-wet the rubber parts. Again, it makes it easier to deal with and it perform makes a better seal, I think. Here they're arranged. So now just the very tips, in other words, at the the half of the orange section is sticking out. Just the very tips, and we're going to dye them scarlet. Here's, here's the scarlet dye. Again, this is a jacquard. Uh, you could use a Dharma dye here, I'm sure. It's a matter of preference. Some jacquard colors seem better to me, and some Dharma colors seem better. They have a nice color chart on the website that's helpful, I think. That said, the percentage of dye you use, the solution makes a huge difference on some of these dyes. Some of them you really have to dilute. And here's the results after dyeing, uh, making a dye bath of the scarlet dye and plunging this thing in. And then this is what resulted. Just the tips now are scarlet. Now I've prepared these in such a way that the bottom sections will get dyed black. And this is our last stage. And what I've tried to do here is go halfway up the remaining yellow area. And I'm going to dye that black. I could have gone a little higher up on the feather than I did. In retrospect, this is a Dharma dye true black. Again, I use an eighth teaspoon and about a half of a, uh, you know, about a quart of water, I guess, if it's a two quart pan. I don't know what that pan is. Quart and a half, half a pan of water. I like using the eighth teaspoon, and I, I used to have a one sixteenth teaspoon that I used all the time that's even more valuable. And I haven't replaced it, it disappeared. I don't know what happened to it. And here is after we've uh, come out of the black dye bath, here's what the uh, roots of the feather now look like. And keep in mind in between each dye bath, clean out that pan really well. Otherwise you can get some residue that'll affect your, the color. And here's a resultant feather, one of the one of the feathers from the batch, and turned out fairly well. You get a little bit of bleeding, which is a good thing. It makes it look more natural. And uh, you got red tips, and you got an orange middle, and yellowish, tannish down down lower. So I'm I'm pretty happy with this, and we'll. Next thing I'll do is I'll tie a fly using these feathers. Uh, that'll be in another video. Okay, I'm back. Can you hear me? Yep, we sure do. Yep. And by the way, John has a question on how long you leave it in the bath. Yeah. Let me, <clears throat> let me talk about dying just a little bit. It's much more an art than it is a science. Um, how long you leave it in the bath varies dramatically depending on the color. And it's because these dyes are made up with natural materials from all over the place. And th so the way they operate changes from color to color. Um, a good example is um, scarlet. Scarlet, throw some feathers in there. They instantly turn red 
right now. Um, and and you, you, you know, the, the minute you see them take a little bit of color, um, you just do a, a, a little bit of uh, citric acid in there. Watch it foam up. Now you know you've got, when it foams like that, it gets in all the nooks and crannies. Um, and then get it out of there because if you leave it in too long, uh, it gets deeper and deeper and it turns brown and all kinds of things can happen. Um, other dyes, um, yellow, um, for instance, you need to use, number one, you need to use a lot more dye. And it won't take that color as quickly. The feathers won't take that color as quickly. And it uh, a lot of times it depends too on the kind of feathers you're using and how well degreased they are and so forth and so on. So it may take it a half an hour um, cooking in there before you can really see any color change. You know, you just kind of check it. Um, from time to time, it can be up to up to a half an hour. Um, some there, there are lots of of variables here. You can't control them all, and what you have to do is just do your best um, and monitor it. Uh, you know, pretty co consistently. The after after they've taken after the feathers have taken just a little bit of color is when I throw in the acid. And there's no time, no specific time there either. It's a feel thing. Um, but you want, them, you want them to definitely have taken some color before you put that acid in. Put that acid in and then it really, um, well, first of all, it fixes the dye so that it's, it stays beautifully. Um, and, uh, then after that, though, you may you may want to leave it in the bath for an hour or two, depending on the dye. <clears throat> um, I want to talk quickly about three other dyeing companies. Uh, Veniard has made fly tie. They're British. And they've made fly tying dyes forever. They're acid leveling dyes as well. Um, Dylon. Um, Available only in the British Isles, I think. Alice Conba used to use Dylon dyes. And uh, they're available or were available in Canada. Um, but there's a company that I really like here in, this, in the States um, called Cushing Dyes. And they're made to dye wool. That's this, the whole point. And you go to a place like a store called The Woolery online, and they've got uh, those dyes, a full range of them, and lots of different colors, and they're, they're, they're very good dyes. So I, I, I highly re recommend the Cushing ones. The other ones are kind of hard to obtain. Um, Veniard's available. Um, uh, let's see, anything else I need to say about dyeing? Oh, Here's a trick. You'll find that dyeing black is very difficult. What happens is you're dyeing some feathers black, and sure enough, it looks like they turn black, and you get them out of there, and they've got a purple sheen to them. So I asked John McLean about this, and, and what he suggested, and it works, is you dye the feathers fluorescent orange first and then you dye them black. And sure enough, then it comes out black. So any any uh, any other questions, uh, comments, suggestions, I'm open to it all. Don also wanted to know about bleaching before dyeing. Bleaching before dying. Well, if Alice Conba did a lot of uh, stripped peacock curl dyeing, 
Um, so you could certainly bleach peacock curl before you dye it. Um, bleaching feathers does not work. I'm here to tell you. The thing that holds the, the, the feathers together go away and it dissolve and the whole feather just goes like this because I tried it with some uh, turkey tail feathers. Um, so you got you got to be careful about bleaching. Hope, hope that answered that. And by the way, don't do anything with dyes and, unless you do a, a, a test, a little test batch, a feather or two, feathers that, you know, are crappy ones that you pulled off the neck. I, I always I always get some some bad feathers that I'm not going to use for testing and and do a full blown test. Put it in your dye bath, put the put the acid in, take it out, shock it with the cold water, um, dry it off because as you dry the feathers, they become lighter. Um, you may think you have the perfect color and you dry them off, and now they're lighter than what you wanted. So there's a lot of playing around. But with a little bit of experience, and I mean a little bit, it's amazing what you can do with these dyes um, and, and do it easily and quickly. Um, when I did the um, – the um, what, was that, what was that fly? The Chief Nidabaugh recently. Um, I dyed the feathers I used for that um, and did it in both the yellow yellow and red red feathers. I dyed, you know, several of each so I could pair them up. Um, no, no more than an hour. Okay, uh, Sherry Steele wants to know if you have the process written up any place. Um, no, but that, but Sherry, the, um, Indian Crow video that you just watched is on YouTube. It's, if you just type in Eric Austin, Indian Crow, I think it'll come right up. Um, let me, let me do, I'm going to, I'll, I'll go do that right now and, and make sure it comes up, but I, but I think it will, uh, hang on. Get It'll be repeated up. on uh, your YouTube channel and my YouTube channel and when we upload this well, video. Th that's true, too. And it's live streamed right now to Facebook, so it's there. So there, there's some places where you can get it, but as far as being written up, I guess there's Eric saying he hasn't written it up. No, no, I haven't. Um, yeah, it's make your own Indian crow, crow substitute. If you, if you type in Eric Austin... Indian Crow comes right up because um, I just did it. Um, but but Sherry, you know, writing it up in in a way is almost pointless um, because there are so many variables. You know, um, I can tell you right now, you know, very in 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 in. 25 words or less, how to do it. You bring the water up to a boil. Then you take some heat off so it, uh, and, and with, with the dye and put the dye in first. Put the water in, mix it up. Bring that to a boil. Then um, back off it to a, where it's just a low simmer. And that low simmer, that's where you're going to put your feathers in. Once the feathers take a little color, you put the acid in. And it's, you know, and it's, and I usually use two one eight teaspoons of this citric acid. And by the way, that's a ball canning product you can get anywhere. That citric acid. So, you know, other than you, it, it is important to degrease the feathers with with that uh, center pole before you, before you do anything. If the feathers have grease on them, they just won't take the acid. They won't take the dye. I'm sorry. 
it's a, it's kind of important as far as the degreasing too. You do not harvest the animal, bird, whatever, what you're dying, and go straight to the dye bath with blood all over everything, being very <laughs> crude. But I cannot tell you how many people have contacted me. Well, I harvested this bird and and I'm having some trouble. And well, did you clean it? I didn't even talk about degreasing. Well, there was a little bit of blood on it, but geez, you know, well, it's all those things are variables, and they all have things that will affect will affect the the dye process. Anything more on your part there, Eric? I think that's it for me. Uh, for for a short time here, I'm just going to keep us on a side by side because I I have to respond to what Eric talked about or uh, agree completely with what Eric talked about. Dying and bleaching feathers is difficult um, because of the little barbules on the barbs that attach to the shaft. If you burn them off, it makes the feather react different. <clears throat> That's why you can't use the bleach. However, you can reduce the color with some types of hydrogen peroxide. Got to be very careful with it. Um, I found basically like Eric, I just don't, I just don't try to bleach the feathers. If I need to dye a feather, I start out with white. And if I have to buy it to get it, then I do. Uh, it's what, what basically what it boils down to. I do a lot of bleaching, but it's all on animal hair. And again, we degrease before we try to bleach. And the, the formula I use for uh, bleaching animal hair is one part hydrogen peroxide that you get at the drugstore. That's a 3% solution to two parts of non-sudsing ammonia. Two parts non-sudsing ammonia, one part hydrogen peroxide. If you're lucky and you can get your hydrogen peroxide from a uh, beauty salon, it will be 15%. The time will take a lot less to, to uh, bleach stuff. But just as an example, I recently bleached uh, some mousse from black to uh, kind of a medium tannish brown. Took three days with this solution. So you don't just throw it in there and come back in 15 minutes and expect it to be done. It's a very slow solution. It's very gentle. doesn't burn stuff up, but it's, uh, it's slow. I'm, I'm going to have to give that a try. That's, that's really great. Um, be sure you uh, use non sudsing ammonia. That's very important. Um, God, I, I had something in my head just a second ago, and it's Sorry. gone. Senior moment. Um, if, if I think about it, I'll speak up again. Yeah, please just cut in if you do. It's a, it, it, I have to just basically uh, echo what Eric talked about. I will discuss one thing. He didn't talk a lot about using RIT dye. RIT dye is something that's available for dyeing of our stuff, and not just feathers, but our fly tying materials. I'll give you a tip. If you're using RIT dye, do not open the packet, take a teaspoon, and reach down inside and take some out and throw it into some water and die with it because you're going to do a small batch, right? And it's supposed to be for like three gallons. So you don't want to use the whole the whole container. Well, that container is just a mixture of different colored powders all thrown together, and they're meant to be mixed all at one time. So if you're going to use just a half or a portion of a writ dye package, you want to do a very concentrated solution in which all of it is dissolved and boiled and everything cooled. And then you can take that solution and let's say a, a drink bottle. That's a, a, that's a, a pint drink bottle or 16 ounce drink bottle. And then you can add small amounts to make small batches. But if you try to just reach in with that teaspoon and get some of the powder, you'll be surprised at the colors you get because it's, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, Mixing dyes. This is acid leveling. It's not RIT. Although you can mix RIT too. I've done it. Um, especially the liquid RIT dyes, which I don't know are, I don't think are as good as the powder. That's just kind of an observation. But anyway, um, <laughs> with acid leveling dyes, it's really difficult to determine what your what your outcome is going to be it's not what you see is what you're going to get so if you want to mix a couple of things and and they mix fine but you've got to be very careful about quantities if you put 
a, just a little bit too much of the darker one. Let's say you're mixing, uh, for the sake of argument, a dark purple with an orange to get a brown or something. Um, you got to be very careful about that dark one. Don't use very, use hardly any of it, you know, and uh, and then do a test and see how it comes out. Um, and you can, if, if, if your materials aren't pure white, you can still work with them. Like if they're tan, let's say, or if they're light gray, you can still maybe get a red out of them, for instance. Um, just not bleaching, not doing anything. As long as the color that you're dyeing is darker, that you're over dyeing is darker than the, the, the color underneath, um, you'll, you'll probably get a, a result. I've done it, um, for instance, with um, goose biots. Um, I had a, I had a, a goose skin and I, I took some biots and I was able to dye them rusty brown, which is what I wanted. I wanted rusty brown goose biots, was able to over dye them, even though they weren't white, they were gray. So um, it's just whatever you're over dyeing, it, it, you can't make something, you can't take black and make it white. You know, you just can't do it. You can't go from dark to light. You got to go the other way. And you also can't take a color like tan and say, well, I'm just going to, I'll make brown out of that. It, brown's darker. And you take a, a tan feather and, and throw it in the brown and catch as catch can is what you're going to get. Uh, it will be very different than if you throw a white feather, a white feather and a tan feather and throw them both in the same dye bath. You get two different colors out. Yeah, it's very true. And you have to use a lot of common sense. But if, you, if you've worked with colors in any capacity in the past, mixing colors to achieve a, a goal, you, you can figure it out. Um, and and some, sometimes it's not in the cards. I, I, there's a couple colors I struggle dying. Um, um, tan being one. Uh, first of all, the tans that you buy in the acid leveling dyes <clears throat> aren't aren't great to begin with, and so you're left with trying to mix a yellow and a, you know something else. And I eventually get there, but it's a lot of plan to get certain colors. Olive, by the way, olive, I, uh, um, it's the jacquard olive is not olive at all. At least not the not the batch I got. It's brown, um, and. Uh, so, you know, one, one, one jar of identical jacquard dye will differ from the next. Different batches, dye batches will differ. So, you know, it's, it's like I said, it's more art than science. It's, um, it definitely is. And I'm, I'm just going to point you at Eric for him giving you a really great um, dissertation on dying yourself. Um, I'm an expert dyer, but I didn't get to be that way out as an average fly tire in all the years I spent at the Weiss. I got to be that way at Whiting Farms. And what I know is proprietary information. So uh, for the biggest part, I'll just tell you, keep your temperatures consistent. Uh, use acid to set it. And acetic acid is the best one the, from the canning store. Eric's already told you about that. Fighting farms use the same thing. That's not taking anything away from uh, or away from the, the proprietary information that I have from them. So the acetic acid is nothing more than uh, the ball canning stuff or something similar. You can also get it in other things. But I have two things today that I want to talk to you about. You already heard about one bleaching. Okay, one part hydrogen peroxide two parts non-sudsing ammonia, non-sudsing ammonia. That's very important. You'll get a terrible mess if you go the other way. Non-sudsing ammonia, hydrogen peroxide. And tell you, just to give you a tip, one of the things that bleach is gorgeous, it just is so pretty, it makes your heart sing, is you take the church window feathers off of a ringneck pheasant. 
imagine those toned down a little bit so that they're tan and white with all the all the markings on them. I'll leave it to you to do other stuff with. Just remember that the bleach formula is a formula that takes time. You don't set it in there and come back in 10 minutes. You Even the bleaching of the church window feathers, you're going to spend 12 hours at least to get to see what you want as far as the changes. Now, here's the next thing, and it's probably the most important thing that I have to offer, is dyeing. Okay, there is no, I'll, I'll make this statement and probably everybody will disagree with me. There is no dye out there that does a good job of taking mallard flank and turning it into a substitute for wood duck. <laughs> Except for the skins off of yellow onions. Really? You dye with the skins from yellow onions over mallard flank, and you'll come as close to a perfect substitute as you'll ever get. So how do you do that? Well, for Gretchen and I, we usually do a few mallard flank feathers at a time. And it's been a while because, quite frankly, we have a huge supply of wood duck. So why would I want to dye mallard flank when I got a huge supply of wood duck? I don't. But there wasn't a time. We didn't always have that. And what we would do is we'd go out and buy five uh, pounds <clears throat> of a good uh, yellow onions, making sure that the skins on the onion are in pretty much intact, not all beat up. And what you do is you take and quarter that onion and take only the dry skin off of the outside. You don't want any of that the next layer, which is slightly, you don't, you don't want it in your soup or your stew or your spaghetti sauce, but it also is a lot whiter and it has a little bit of moisture in it. You want the dry onion skin. Cut them into quarters. That makes it easy to take and just strip each quarter, that out, outside layer off, and then put them into a pan and boil them in water for uh, that, that five pounds should give you uh, about a gallon of solution. Boil them for about an hour. Let them cool. Strain them. You've got the solution. Go from there. You'll figure out how much you need based on how your feathers take the solution. And remember, same thing as what Eric talked about. Degrease, degrease, degrease. You don't have to worry about setting with, uh, with uh, acetic acid. With this, it, it will do... a. Uh, uh, a great job without the acetic acid. There are other things that you can use. The tea you drink in the evening, uh, or I drink in the evening, if you're a person from the UK, you drink tea all day long. But anyway, that tea can make some really interesting colors in, in feathers. But the only one I'm going to talk with any certainty about is yellow onion skins for dyeing uh, mallard to, uh, to wood duck. And I'll take questions from anybody, but I have a comment about about the the mallard too. Uh, I, I think it's important if you're gonna if you're gonna imitate wood duck with mallard, just to make sure you got the right shape feathers. A lot of mallard tends to be a little more pointy than when when you want it more flat on top. So you got it. You got to really select these feathers out. Is all I'm saying. Uh, carefully. Uh, I like, place, I like the, the flattish top. The place where, it, and Eric's right, for the normal wing type stuff that you do, I used a lot of this type of substitute uh, for wing cases on nymphs and stuff like that. When the, oh, when the gotcha. nymph calls for a, a, a um, wood duck, you can get by with the mallard flank. Uh, just some of the longer fibers that don't have quite the tips on them that you want, they're good for wing cases. <clears throat> Sure. Right. Any questions, or we can now just get out, drop our spotlights, and we can just get down to the discussion forum. Remove and remove spotlight. And if we're not on a gallery view, you may want to get to a gallery view. And there we are, all of us still here and ready to chat with whatever you want to chat about. Sherry, um, are are you are you at all comfortable with the idea of acid level dying? Or, well, I have to. Would try you it. like me to send you? I, I mean, I can send some. I can put some instructions together and send them to you. Well, I yeah. would watch the video and then write it up. 
uh, because I follow directions, you know, like a recipe. <laughs> I'm kind of do recipes. Well, this is one time you don't want to do that, to be honest. Well, it's uh, just, step one, just, step two, step yeah, three. Right. Uh, and, and there are distinct steps, certainly. And uh, all you'd have to watch is the beginning part of the video. It, it You know, the first the yeah, yeah. red dye you, thing yellow or tannish yellow, whatever it is. Well, I do yeah. have a question on dyeing synthetics. Um, that I have, done I have done? not done. So okay. I'm I don't know. Have you have you dyed synthetics, Al? Uh, prepare to be disappointed. <laughs> yeah, I'll give you an example. I would just absolutely love to take some of this clear Antron that we've got here that we do on some of the LaFontaine patterns and be able uh -huh. to dye it. Don't waste your time. All you're going to do is have it rub off on your hands when you're tying the fly on your leader in the river. <laughs> it just it doesn't happen. I don't know how they get it done. I've even tried a pressure cooker. I mean, I got that. If, if you <laughs> want to see a mess, use a pressure cooker with Antron. What a mess. Jesus Christ. Just don't do it. Well, I, I did. Um, uh, Blue Ribbon Flies used to make the perfect color Zelon that I use for my soft tackles <clears> at the <throat> underwing. And they kept not getting the dye correct. And uh, so uh, the package that I buy, I dunk it in bleach to remove some of the color, and I'm able to get closer to what I'm looking for. And But I just wonder if I should try getting white and then coloring it up or keep bleaching the ones that I need. <laughs> Just so you know, acid level only acid leveling dyes only work with um, natural products, if you will. Um, uh -huh. uh, they they won't work with synth synthetics at all. There are dyes for synthetics for certain synthetics, but I think there I think it's pretty involved, and there you could probably find those on the Dharma site, D H A R M A. Yeah. That's where I buy all my dyes. And uh, well, that's where I buy the acid, the the Jacquard and the Dharma dyes is buy from that site. And that site also has different kinds of dyes for doing different things. So you, you might look at that. Okay. Well, right now, but, I just dump it in regular old bleach that you would bleach well, anything with. Got to do what you got to do. <laughs> yeah, it, it gives me a little bit more closer to the color, but it's not exactly what I'm looking for. And I'm going to run out. Putting in the bleach sherry is not feathers, right? No, it's it's a zelon. Zelon. Okay, got it. Okay, no problem. It's yeah. a crinkled zelon. Got and it. And I need this color, but lighter. <clears throat> and so. Uh, try the uh, bleach. The method that I just told you with the one part hydrogen peroxide and two okay. parts, you may have to leave it in for a few days, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I guarantee you it's not going to bleach so fast that you don't know how it got to be white so quick because that, that mm -hmm. won't happen. <clears throat> okay. I'll, I'll pile on what, uh, what, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, let me know, uh, try a piece of a cherry, and then let me know the result, because I'll keep track of it so that we, if the question comes up. Okay, Mike, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, I'll kind of pile on with what uh, Eric was talking about, but in a different way. I did dye uh, some mallard uh, using the onion skins, and it did turn out pretty nice. Uh, I did not select my feathers, and so I've got some that are beautiful and some that are like oval, oval shaped you know, oblong. Um, what I really like to use that for, uh, there's like when I use wood duck for tails, legs, and like they said, wing cases, um, you don't want to eat up your, especially as expensive as wood duck is nowadays, you don't want to eat up your beautiful wood duck to make tails and, and legs. You don't really have to. Um, Tim Flagler has a uh, wood duck nymph. The tail is wood duck. The body is actually wrapped like a like a pheasant tail nymph with uh wood duck and then of course i think it has a wire rib the wing case is wood duck and then the legs are wood duck and uh it's a really cool looking fly with a lot of 
fine dark markings that uh, the natural um, mayfly nymphs have. Uh, so it's a really cool fly, but it, it could really get expensive when you're doing something like that with the real thing. So with those uh, dyed mallard um, feathers that aren't maybe the, the best ones for making wings, you could definitely do uh, something like that. Oh. A place that you might look, okay, the commercial uh, dyes that a lot of organizations use is made by Keystone. Now, I've never found it in quantities less than about three gallons, and that's a lot of that's a lot of powder to to use. And and uh, so, I, Gretchen and I have got still got some of that that we use for dyeing our black that we, that we got Keystone dyes, and that you might give them a try if you can get them in smaller quantities, but you don't want three gallons because even if you shared with all your fly people in your fly club, it's still more than you're ever going to need. Can't as, use as it an all. Example. <laughs> yeah. And there, there used to be something called fly dye. I think that, and it, it, it only came like in five pound quantities or something. And, you know, if you have a fly <laughs> shop, I guess, and are dying, I don't know, white necks done or something, maybe it's useful, but I could never see I will share one, just one story with you regarding vineyards dye. In uh, 98, Gretchen and I did a, well, we did all through the 90s, we did shows all, all, across, all over Europe, including the UK. And we got to be good friends with Peter Vineyard, who is the owner of Vineyards. And so we went to visit. We got to watch, go to the dye room and watch those dyes being mixed. Mm -hmm. Very, uh, a very, uh, a very amazing experience is the only thing I can say. The guy that had was mixing the dyes had been doing it for 40 years and he went, I'll throw some of this in and that's how it got mixed and it, it was dead on every single time. So I said to Peter, I said, you know, that guy looks to me like he's getting awful close to his mid sixties. He says, yeah, I, I am. I said, yeah, I said, you don't even need to say it. I'm already worried to death. What the heck am I going to do when he retires? I said, well, you better get it figured out somewhere. And I guess he did because they, they're still very consistent dyes, but the same guy he isn't mixing them that he had at that time. <clears throat> Terry, Terry Hellickson, uh, who wrote a couple of great books, one, one of which is, I think it's called Fish Flies. It's, it's a huge like encyclopedia of, of flies. Um, told me this story about some guys at a fly shop, they got in a load of guinea skins. Now, I don't know if you've ever gotten a, a, just a guinea skin, but they are nasty. And they had like a slop sink in the back of the shop. So they, they took all these guinea skins. They wanted to clean them up and they put them, they put them in there. And <laughs> something happened. And these things, they, they forgot about them or something. And they festered for a few days. And so they, somebody walked back there and the smell was just overpowering. So they immediately drained the, drained the water. Well, that was a mistake uh, because it, it got into the sewers and formed sewer gas and there was an explosion. <laughs> they had to close down the entire strip mall with, with this, with this flash shop was. <laughs> Oh man! So I, yeah, you gotta, gotta be careful. Back in the eighties, when I first met Frank Johnson, who many of you knew before he passed away, uh, but he was a professional in the industry for all of his life. He was in in the fly. And anyway, at the time I met him, uh, uh, he had a fly shop in Missoula, and so I was I was needing feathers uh, from a fly tying a cackle. So we would buy the stuff from India and it would come in these 30 gallon drums and it was packed in this white powder that would kill you from 30 feet. I mean, if you got even 30 feet away from it, it would kill you. I don't know what the stuff was, but it was bad. We would wear masks and gloves and everything. And it still, you'd cough for, for months after unpacking one of those things. I don't know what they were, but we'd wash them all then and get them ready to go into his store. And I'd get my cut of the, of the capes and the rest of them went to his store. But, it was amazing what we went through back in the day until 
places like Whiting Farms and all the others have changed all that for us. And an interesting thing happened. There's a, a, a store just opened here in Bozeman, or Bo in Boise, called Shields. And I, I know they have them there in Mike Kelly's country, and uh, they're starting to show up around the country. Well, anyway, we went out there, and then their fly tying section is pathetic is a good way to put it. And it's the first time I've seen an India cape for sale on the wall was in Shields just just this last week, I didn't even know you could buy India capes anymore, but I guess they're still available. <clears throat> yeah, I, I got something. Um, many years ago, I was looking for, you know, a really good done cape, and they were hard to come by a long time ago. And um, I looked and looked, and finally I talked to this tire. He was lived up in uh, New York. Uh, Eric might know him, Del Mesa. Really good oh, fly yeah. tire. I know I know that name. Yeah. Yes. And he told me you buy white hen necks and white rooster necks and you take Lady Clarol. I forgot the number, but it said something about black and white on the die. And I'll tell you, my buddy and I, we didn't know what we were doing, but we came up with some beautiful done colored necks. Wow. <laughs> well, I've always wondered about hair dyes. Yeah, lady, you know, it's lady it's Clairol. I, I've got to find out that number again. But back then, you could get the white because, like Al said, whiting is what he's done with all the everything. You can just buy this stuff. But back then, it was tough to get a good done cake. It was, it was tough to get a, any any kind of decent hackle yeah. back in the 60s and 70s. Yeah, the, yeah. The sourcing of materials is... I, I One of the people that we, Gretchen and I we're involved with from early on and I was involved in even before Gretchen and I got married with Steve Knurk at Rocky Mountain Dubbing. And he's a person that supplies to the places like Wapsi that then supplies it out to the rest of the world. I mean, he was the importer. And I asked him one day, because I would always go to Lander, Wyoming and select my calf tails because I'd get about, oh, 500 calf tails a year and I'm making sure they were all nice and straight. And you don't always fall, find nice straight ones in the fly shops. Anyway, so I ask you, where do you get these things? God, I, he says, oh, I have to go to Uzbekistan to get them. <laughs> Can, do you ever have any idea that the, that the calf tails were coming from Uzbekistan or whatever how you pronounce that? I was just stunned. I mean, anyway, it's a... Funny. Interesting. Anyway, getting to calf tails, back before I found him as a source where I could get some really good ones, I tried everything under the sun to get good, straight calf tail for tying royal waltz and all that kind of junk, even to the point of getting hair straightening from the from the, uh, the beauty supply house. And it works, but Jesus Christ, it takes a $2 uh, tail and turns it into a $20 tail and you can't hardly afford to tie with the darn thing after you get it all straightened out. Anyway, just the crazy stuff that you do over the years until somebody finds out that Uzbekistan is a great place to get calf tails. Well, I seems like everybody's winding down. Or if I mention Uzbekistan, it scared everybody into the next county. So one of the two. So <laughs> if there's nothing else. This was a good one. Good. I'm glad it uh, worked out for you. The fun, the, the tool one should be fun next week. I'm going to share a part of history with you when when it comes to my part for the tools. I mean, I've got I've got tools here that, like everybody, a special whip finisher made by a friend uh, who is only one of a kind and some of that kind of stuff. But we're going to talk about rotary tying with a treadle sewing machine. Oh, that's going to be fun. But we ain't gonna do it because I can't. I can't do it. Gretchen's the only one in this household that can do it, and uh, it's not as easy as it used to be. All I can tell you is that. But anyhow, will it still be Wednesday? Next Wednesday. When, next next Wednesday, we're gonna do Dream tools. Time. Everybody gets to talk about tools, and I'm gonna talk about uh, the way fly, the way commercial tying was back in the 1920s and 30s in the U.S. Yeah, and I'd love it if if everyone just showed a given tool, you know. Uh, we, we're going to see a lot of tools, believe me, just Dick Shaw's stuff alone. 
but um you know i i have a i have a pet favorite tool and uh and i'm not big on tools but boy this thing i i don't know if i could tie a fly without it at this point and i'll i'll show i'll show that um other tires are not as enthused as i am about this tool but i i lean on it constantly so I'll show that next week and a bunch of dick stuff. Well, Dave Buckner, be sure you bring uh, the ones you shared with us the other day for painting eyes on flies. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, the, that's the ones that I showed. I can tell you, it's a lot, a lot cleaner looking. Mine was pretty, pretty rugged by by comparison. That's it for this week, folks. Thank you so much for joining us. For now, it's a wrap. Until next time. <laughs>